Now more than ever, innovative technologies are fueling change and sparking new ways of thinking. Collaboration between corporations and startups is key to staying at the forefront of these trends. However, finding the right startups can be expensive, time-consuming, and ineffective. But Plug and Play is here to help. As a corporate partner, you will gain access to a whole ecosystem of innovation. Discover startups that meet your tech interests. Stay updated on the latest trends and network with industry peers. We will help you during every stage of your innovation journey, no matter where you are and where you want to go. Get in touch today. Hi guys, welcome everyone to day five of our Summer Summit 2021. So this morning, California time, we're kicking off the IoT Expo and we're super thrilled to have you all join us today. Thank you so much for coming today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jan Ackermann. I'm part of the Smart Cities team. And today I have the great pleasure to introduce to you today's agenda. So let's jump right into it. We'll be starting with a little trend overview and some housekeeping, and we'll follow up with a keynote presentation from Britta Rudolfi the Head of Technology Innovation and Business Development at Vodafone. After that, it's time for our startups of Batch 14 to pitch on stage and present their solutions, which they have been working on intensively together with some of you guys, our corporate partners, for the past three months. Please join our poll and vote for your favorite startup so that we can determine and announce the winner, the winner um, at the end. Last but not least, we will have some closing remarks, wrapping up the official part of today's expo, and we'll transition to our networking break so you all can engage with the community here and, of course, with our startups. But more on that in a short bit. Now let's quickly have a look at some of the most noticeable trends that we have seen out there around industrial and IoT. So in talking about industrial tech trends, it's usually somehow connected to the topic of automation which in the past year specifically was driven even more by COVID as a lot of facility shutdowns happened due to a low level of digitization. So of course, there are several underlying trends along the road that enable factories and their processes to become smarter, which we will take a, a closer look at now. Generally, there are four stages, if you will, that new technologies have developed around. Starting with connecting the assets and generating data, sensors such as connected devices and cameras, for example, play a key role um, in the collection of data points. And closely related to that is asset monitoring, where machine signals are used to monitor health and performance, for example, for, industrials, for industrial assets, um, manufacturing lines, or really any machinery. Um, so something making this and other processes more efficient is fog and edge where the computing is being moved closer to the end device to decrease latency um, and also to use less bandwidth on the cloud. And last but not least, we've been talking about machine health and performance, but obviously we can also use wearables, for example, um, to measure the same for our human employees. So now that our workflows are connected, we can use the collected data to optimize our workflows. Artificial intelligence generally helps us to get more insights out of our collected data. For example, can we make camera footage useful with the help of computer vision? And we can use machine signals from sensors for predictive maintenance. But again, not only machine processes can be optimized with the help of AI, but also can the data be used for people management to optimize schedules and tasks. If you want to go one step further, in order to optimize certain tasks, we need to automate them. Robotics can augment and replace labor entirely. Automating inspection and decision-making drives quality assurance. And if we take a look at our warehouses, automation can drastically increase productivity and reduce the labor costs. And combining store performance insights with existing ERP allows for increased efficiency for ordering and logistics. And finally, in order to continuously improve all of the above, we gotta track stuff, right? So generally, we differentiate between people movement and the movement of goods. 
Tracking the path of workers and customers can allow you to predict for behavior and their preferences. And tracking goods helps with the use of supplies within the facility. But it's really equally important to track goods also outside the facility across the supply chain as well. So while tracking helps to cut down inefficiencies and improve demand forecasting and planning, it also helps to move to a more circular waste stream for materials waste and packaging alike. All right, guys, now let's get ready and briefly discuss the new features of Attendify. If you want to check out the agenda and pitch order of startups, go click the live stream button on your left to review the agenda for each day of the summit. To review company overviews and connect with the teams, go to the virtual startup booths and filter them to your liking. If you want to engage, connect live with the Meet Now feature or just send them a message. With Meet Now, you can start a one-on-one -on -one video chat with startups at their booth, which is a really cool new feature. Just make sure there's a green video icon, which means the person of your interest is available to video call. If you want to find a specific person, you can go to the community and participants tab and search the profiles of all summit attendees and send private messages there. All right, all this being said, I hope I was able to get you guys excited for the program to follow. And with that, I would like to introduce my colleague Leonardo from our Ventures team, who will be your MC for the keynote and Q&A to follow. Everyone have a great summer summit and have a great IoT Expo today. Leo, handing it over to you now. Thank you for the intro, Jen. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure for me being here in front of you on a live stream today to, to, uh, for this very exciting summer summit. One more year has passed and the world seems changing even faster than we imagine. But we want to give you a taste of what is going to happen in the world of tomorrow directly into the comforts of your homes or workplaces. Before starting the summer summit, I would like to thank everyone that has, has made this possible. To, have, to the startup companies and our corporate partners that from the most beautiful corners of the globe have been amazing, dedicating time and effort to help create this unique ecosystem. And finally, the team was spending endless hours for successful engagement between startups and corporations. And last but not least, thank you all for joining and supporting the startup companies and the growth of plug and play IoT ecosystem. Well, at this point, you are asking yourself, who is this guy in front of you with a strange accent? My name is Leonardo Rocchetti and part of the Smart Cities team. If you want to get my attention, you can talk to me about cities, sustainable living, and the impact of moonshot technologies in our society. And as a passionate of artificial intelligence and cutting edge technology, I'm glad to be here in front of you as a today's MC. I would love to discuss with you about the impact of these technologies in our everyday life and how we can use them to create an equal and a more sustainable society. But our amazing startups can't wait to tell you more about what they are creating. As a reminder, today we will have 16 startups divided into four categories, starting from artificial intelligence, smart and healthy workplace, hardware and advanced project, uh, advanced product, and closing with smart factory. Well, before the official takeoff, please put your seat back fast and because we are very excited to invite on the summer summit stage a very special guest. I'm sure that we will not need the emergency exits. In her professional career and personal life, has always been an opinion leader about technology and networks, with a purpose to enhance their potential to democratize the access of information on a global scale. In her career has changed many times the status quo of the business as usual by addressing new business opportunities on top of new technologies within her creature, the Vodafone 5G Lab. I'm glad to invite here on the stage of the Summer Summit, Britta Rudolph, the Head of Technology and Business Development at Vodafone, that is going to help us to have a better view on how fast connection is going to shape our businesses and lives tomorrow. Let's welcome Britta on the stage with a warm with our applause on the chat. Welcome, Britta. Thank you. Warm welcome from my side. I'm really happy to be here and um, yeah, today I want to talk about how we transformed our labs. So really moving on from Telco to Petco and um, yeah, 
I cannot see my slides. I hope that is, uh, that is okay. And someone else is sharing them. Uh, uh, Leonardo, ah, okay, there they are. I can see them, perfect. All right, so um, today's agenda is gonna cover, well, roughly five points, let's put it like that. So first of all, it's, uh, it's about really what's, what's the difference about telcos and techos and why is that a global trend uh, which is going on in the industry? Then um, the other one is obviously I, technology is in the driver's seat in that concept. And uh, why is that starting in the lab? And also how do we connect industries in the lab? That is a topic I wanna to cover today. And last but not least, we're gonna go also through a couple of lessons learned because especially in the, in the IoT area, we did quite some lessons learned. So I'm really happy to talk you through the, the presentation today and also to answer a couple of questions in the end. So um, moving to the next slide. Um, so um, yeah, moving from telco to techco. So 2G, 3G, 4G, I think it all sounds like a very smooth transition from one chapter or one generation to the next. But actually it is on the one thing, yes, because B2B and B2C um, requirements and applications were kind of overlapping. So there was not a, a huge difference. So first with 2G, you, we wanted to connect places. With 3G, we wanted to connect people. With 4G, it started a bit to, to differentiate because then we also connect machines. But what is behind these smooth transition is actually architectural change that is not that obvious. So 2G was circuit switched um, architecture. With 3G, there was really a massive break. Let's put it like that because we moved to a packet switch network. 4G was actually easy because it was still packet switched. And obviously the next generation is bringing us to new challenges. But let's stick to 2G, 3G and 4G because that was the classic telco environment. And the labs that we did in the telco labs, if we move to the next slide, was really serving that purpose. So technology was there. It was technology from technology people to technology people. So as I always say, it was uh, very well hidden and really, let's say, not the best way explained. Um, it was managed like a cost center. So you really tried to optimize as much as you could. You tried to really get your own people out of the lab and give it maybe to other people. And it was really focused on testing. So, um, but what has changed is Obviously, technology is more in the driver's seat, and this has to do with the introduction of 5G. So coming to 5G, we're again at the, at the new start of an era because we're changing the architecture again. So we're moving to a code-centric network. And this is bringing, I think, first of all, the most obvious one, and this is more capacity and speed. So that's, I think, something everyone can relate to, and probably you don't need a dedicated place to explain that. But there are two other features that are really uh, a game changer for all customers globally, but especially for B2B. And this is ultra low latency, and it's also the capacity to, to, to tailorize networks. So we don't only have one big macro network, we also have um, smaller private networks um, that we can bring to the customer in different ways. And so with 5G, we're literally connecting everything. And as you can imagine, to find the right everything, it's, it's not that everyone wakes up in the morning and says like, oh yeah, I know exactly what I want to do with uh, complex technology. So first of all, you need to break it down. You need to explain it well, and then, um, you need to sit together with the customer and um, co-create. So that's what we did in the lab. So we, we really changed our approach and said, as a tech company, we don't think that, um, please go to the next slide. As a tech company, we're, we're starting with technology because we want to create internal impact, internal indirect growth, in the sense that we are hands-on on the technology. We know exactly what we're talking about. We know about the features 
and um, we push it to the borders so we understand what what does it really bring. Um, second step is making an external impact. So trying to create pictures, a story, you know, what technology brings purpose to people and um, where even my mom at home understands why, for example, 5G is a game changer. The third step moving up is when we also create direct growth but keep it internal is when we say that solution that we, where, that we try technically where we talked uh, in a nice story about where we created the picture that we also use it ourselves so eat your own dog food you know the, it's always as good as you as the need that you want to do it yourself and then the last one that's ultimately champions league inside the lab if you're really create new business inside the lab and transition it to a proper product development. So that's these are the four steps that we try to enable in the labs. And we basically add it to the, let's say, single testing purpose that the lab used to have in, inside the telco, different, uh, um, different aspects. So we have these four different labs that we created in two different locations. So first of all, the 5G lab, IoT Future Lab, the Innovation Garage, and the 5G Mobility Lab, which is an outside, outdoor um, mobility lab an hour away from our headquarter. And so what did we add to the testing? So first of all, we added an inspirational space. So where we really showed um, business applications that are running on real technology. So it's no slides, it's no fake setups. It's really realized with what is technically feasible at the moment. Second thing that we added is really um, uh, the ability to co-create. So we wanted a space where we don't only test for ourselves, but where we can sit together with customers, test with them together, where we can do design thinking workshops, where we can really open our labs towards the public. And with the innovation garage, that's our area to connect with uh, students from university, we also wanted to acquire new skills and get in touch really with latest trends from the universities. And in the 5G Mobility Lab, as it already says, we wanted to connect especially with the mobility sector. So not only cars, but also drones and everything you can imagine, because in the end, we realized that we need to have that kind of testing space to really try out these kind of um, new combinations and new business solutions. But um, to give you a bit of an idea of how this really looks, we have a really small video to just uh, give you a glimpse of how this new Techo Lab looks like. Okay, so talking about how we connect industries there. Um, 5G actually started with the biggest B2B proposition, which was about mobile private networks. And what is a mobile private network? It's basically tons of servers that run an, um, a network on its own on customer premise. And I mean, of course, you could put it in a standard 19-inch rack, 
but we decided to do our first prototype really in a different way. So that also just design makes you understand that the technology inside is really innovative. So that was our first 5G MPN. And of course, as a customer, you would say, yeah, okay, I'm buying a network from Vodafone. So what's the big deal about it? So it's becoming interesting if you show people what can you do on top. And we started to create new applications and showcases where we specially demonstrated the ultra low latency part. So how do we how do we show really the internet in real time? And we also thought, how can we make usage of that network in our own labs? So pre-COVID times, we gave a lot of guided tours, um, personally, of course. With COVID, obviously, it was hard to access the lab or to impossible. So the plan that we had is, okay, let's take uh, one of these cute little robots, put it on top of an AGV, so an autonomous guided vehicle, and do an fully autonomous guided lab tour. And um, of course, you would say, okay, how many customers do, do like want to buy an autonomous guided lab tour? But I think the idea here is that AGVs Sorry, I'm back. Um, that AGVs were um, are commonly known in the industry 4.0. So everyone who's running a modern factory hall knows how AGVs work, that they need ultra low latency so that they are not bumping into each other, or that they are not hurting people. So that's the way on how we solve our own problems, let's say eating our own dog food while also connecting it to different industries so that they understand, ah, okay, so that's something that I can enable with 5G and these are the hurdles, these are the opportunities. So, but in between 4G and 5G, there is sometimes I even want to say a world on its own. So it's called uh, low power wide area networks. and. Um, Vodafone, I mean, this is mainly narrowband IoT and CAT-M technologies. So really where you try to connect the smallest things, but where you also drive massive IoT, which is also part of 5G. And uh, the trick here is that you want to do it as energy efficient as possible and as low cost as possible. Um, also, since more and more technologies are coming into play, I mean, just on that page, there are a couple on it and they're even more next to that, people or customers become more and more confused on what's the right technology for me. So we started to um, go into a co-creation journey and say, we, we wanna start to build up rapid prototyping skills and actually started the whole thing with the political discussion with which was going on in Germany during the 5G auction, because when, um, one political party leader said, I'm not sure if every milk can needs to be connected to 5G. And that was quite a discussion. And we thought, okay, let's take that discussion to the next level and take it through our four boxes. So we took that milk can and said, yeah, 5G is not the right technology, but we think narrowband IoT is the right technology. So we connected it to narrowband IoT, to like temperature um, level, all of that um, tracking, uh, we took it to a farmer, so box two, presented it to him. We made a little film combined with other agricultural IoT cases. And then we said, of course, we're not owning a farm, but we have a canteen or a cafeteria where we always have that cool milk. Why shouldn't we use that milk can even there? So we used the milk can there. And then the next step was to transform the leveling technology basically to bigger tanks, because this is how farming, how farmers work these days on, on dairy farms. And that's how we took it over to that next level um, tank. Um, and um, that's actually also where we really learned a lot about smart level cases so measuring milk is one thing um, measuring another non-liquid content is a different thing so but as i said that was kind of like a, a jokey beginning but we also took it to a more serious level when an energy company approached us and they basically said yeah um at the moment our trouble is we have tons of some um, of smart meters out there 
example connected to heaters. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, and they are all working with a very old technology, which is called wireless MBUS. So the technology is basically screaming all day to the streets how much um, how much um, heating you've already used, and then there are people driving through the streets and collecting all these all these um, all these measurements. Um, but that's of course not state of the art, and it's also very faulty because sometimes it's not collecting it correctly. You need to drive double and all of that. So that energy company, and on a working level, I have to say, they were looking for a new solution. And we actually um, talked with them and said, like, yeah, but can can't you exchange all these these heating solutions? And they said, oh no, that's too expensive. And so we said, okay, but, but let's build a gateway with narrowband IoT where you can collect all these measurements and just send it over the cellular network to your headquarters so that you can get rid of all the driving and collecting and all of that. And the interesting part was you might think, well, that's a no brainer, but basically their management said, well, we're not convinced. We're not really sure about that new technology. Is it really working indoors? And there was a lot of discussion going on and basically what we did, we built a so-called network analyzer where we said, okay, we're gonna put in one device um, something for you to measure 2G and narrowband IoT and CAT M. And then you can walk around in every building and every cellar and see uh, if you're really getting the measurements and if that's a feasible solution for you. And that's that's actually um, the prototype that we built. And they took it to their management. They did all their measurements. They were were fine and convinced and uh, now we're developing together that new solution really on a on a productification level so and on top we're also certifying that solution that's also something that we do in the lab so it's really an end-to-end -end solution not only the hardware but also dashboard the certification end-to-end -end, you really know that it's a hundred percent working so um what are the lessons learned of all of this um so first of all, and I just said it with the network analyzer, customers want to make future-proof investments. So it's not enough to just show them on a slide that compared to other technologies, your technology is the right one. And it's also not okay to just say, yeah, just exchange your old stuff and get new stuff in because this is most of the time not building a business case. And also you need to keep in mind that a lot of, technologies that are up and running at the moment, for example, like 3G, they have been shut down completely in Germany this month, this month, actually. So you really need to make sure that if you're building a new product, you're building on reliable technology, which will be in the market for the next decades, ideally. So and with the network analyzer, that was something where we really helped the product development to convince on customer side that this is right technology for them to use. Second learning is get inspired first and then follow a structured approach. So I think um, expectation, so if we move to the next slide, please. Um, so the expectations when you talk to customers and also the knowledge is very different. So sometimes you meet customers and they are really not inspired sometimes it's too obvious what they could do so they, so that they don't come up with it sometimes you have the other end of the customer he's dreaming of uh, i don't know of the moon and it and and the moon is supposed to cost one dollar and it's really hard to find kind of like, like a compromise where you say yeah look i think this is feasible and that would be the price for that are you still with me so and this is something that um that where you have have a clear conversation which is on the one hand inspiring and mind opening but also keeps people to the ground of what is possible third learning if we move on to the next slide um, that's actually one of my favorite cases um, it was an early prototype for a smart pick case so um, I know it sounds funny, but we really try to increase the welfare of um, pig farming in Germany and did a trial together with a startup called Vetweiss, um, who is doing AR, uh, no, not AR, but AI camera analytics on how pigs move inside their, their pig bay and are they okay, do they bite each other and all of that. 
And we combine that with the smart device where um, a lot of different um, uh, data was collected. So, and I think there the important part was we were the telco experts, they were farming experts or the, the vet experts, let's put it like that. And if you want to co-create a new solution together, you need to bring the experts early on and have a discussion. And my last and most important learning, and I'm glad that I was allowed to take that picture of the boys is really don't drive your people away from technology outside the lab away from the customer drive them to the customer on site drive them to the technology get your hands dirty that's the best start into innovation and yeah i hope you enjoyed the sessions with these final words so thank you Thank you, Brita. Thank you very much. I think that now, like all the attendees, will have like a better understanding of uh, these technologies and how the taco industry is changing. And I will invite to the all the attendees to hold the audience that if you have questions, you can use the chat. And our team is going to pick some of them uh, to ask to Brita. So, like, feel free like to write them on the chat. But in the meanwhile, I will ask to um, to ask you some questions, Brita, uh, after your amazing uh, speech. And the first one would be. Uh, I'm very curious like to know from you like that we are surrounded by internet connection uh, but why this technology is going to help us to make a step ahead in our society well I think um, technology has helped us already so much and I think COVID is actually the most powerful example of why we need that technology. I mean, uh, the masses of data were exploding and uplink and downlink. Um, everyone was relying on a stable internet connection. And so, so that's kind of like the basic thing around um, connectivity and why, why it's important. But I think there are so many things out there still to be imagined that were it will change so many business from, from small to big. Um, and with 5G, as I said, so the real time internet, so all these applications, they will become truly mobile. And um, yeah, I think there's uh, still a lot to come. Yeah, thank you. And like, according to that topic, like, what do you think are the biggest barriers to the 5G adoption? For example, technological, political, economical. So what do you think about that? Well, I think, um, first of all, I mean, there I can only speak for Germany, but uh, really the political approval processes are very lengthy. And I mean, everyone's talking agile now. And um, well, at least not the political system is becoming that agile as most industries probably would wish them to be. So that's one big thing. And also, and I think um, you have to be honest there, not everyone is embracing new technology as maybe we do here on the summer summit there is still a lot of skepticism around new technology also especially at towards 5g and um and i think that's that is also something that's becoming tricky because i mean people are not saying i'm skeptic step skeptical about 5g and this is why i'm now going to drop my phone and not going to go in the internet anymore so they want both you know and having both at the same time is going to be uh, going to become hard but that's why i think it's important to educate people to open up technology places such as the lab and to really explain and take away fear yeah yeah i i agree with you and but you we all know that also like changing business in an organization is an art challenge and what do you think is in your opinion is the hardest challenge to evolve your organization from an infrastructure company to a tech one? Well, first of all, attracting the right talent and skills. So, um, I mean, I don't know if you've been the SIM card um, super expert or guru of the 90s, you know, this won't save you in a 5G fully virtualized time, you know, so so the very good and great experts that we have, you need, they need to evolve their skill set and you need to get new people to bring in the new skills um, and new perspective, perspectives on top. 
Um, and on top of that, I think it's really also the mindset inside an organization. And actually, I think here it starts with the management, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, really about trust, about um, giving people responsibility to make the right decisions and uh, to give them space to, to be innovative. I think that's uh, the biggest thing, actually, that we need inside an organization. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, I would like to, if you don't, if we don't have, to have any question from the from the audience, I would like to go from the last question about. So you talked uh, to us and you told us like many examples of 5G applications, but what what was and what is like the most surprising or unusual 5G use case that you worked on? Um, well, that, that's a, a harder one to explain because um, we thought of where can 5G not go so well? And um, so, and this is obviously underwater. So how can you connect underwater worlds? And um, so we got in touch with another company which is skilled in another technology. So, um, um, and they are having like, they brought in a technology which is called LiFi. So um, data transmission over light. So what we tried is that we connected an iPad underwater with Li-Fi and then did the backhauling over 5G. So really bringing in two very different technologies together to, to create an end-to-end -end solution for an environment which is unconnected for now. And um, that was actually a pretty interesting case because we learned so much about, about uh, aquariums. <laughs> thank you very much. And I, I think it's very interesting. And no, I would like to thank you again. <laughs> I would like to thank Thanks you again, Greta. Having... Yeah, like it was a Thanks. pleasure for us having you. And I would like the audience like to uh, give you a virtual applause on the chat. And we we hope to see you in the networking session at the end of the startup pitches. And see you later. Thank you again, Britta. Sure. Thank you. Bye bye. Have a good evening. Bye bye. Now. I think that uh, the moment that everybody uh, are waiting for uh, is having a beginning. So we are coming up with the startup pitches. But before, like uh, starting with uh, our startups, I would like to give, uh, uh, I would like to invite you that if you would love to give a special, a special shout out to a startup team for the great presentation or for the great performance, you can vote for your favorite startup directly via pool that will pop up on Attendify. And now to start, let's open the door to a technology that sooner or later will help us taking decision and giving us a greater understanding of the world we live in, the AI. In fact, if you think about that, every day in our professional and private lives, we ask ourselves, what will happen if I do that? Or I go on the other path? Well, I would like to, to invite to the stage, the company that solves this issue. Casalens has developed an AI solution that is able to understand the cause-effect relationship of your actions in your business thanks to their algorithm. Casalens, the stage is yours. At Casalens, we are on a mission to optimize businesses around the world by developing AI that truly understands cause and effect. Every day, the global economy is increasingly driven by data. And as a consequence, many organizations are sitting on vast amounts of data that can be of great value. However, extracting value from that data is costly, and sometimes it's hard to know where to even start. Unfortunately, the current state of machine learning is not up to the task. The main problem is that machine learning relies on historical correlations. This means that algorithms find patterns that happen to fit past data instead of finding the true drivers of a target. Also, models are static and are not updated as new information becomes available. And models like neural networks behave like a black box. They essentially offer no explanation of how the output was achieved. Cosonance was created to solve these problems and provide a better alternative. The key to all we do is causality, which is in our name. So we have developed a platform to find true causal drivers rather than just features that happened to correlate. Causal AI models are dynamic which maintain performance when in production. And another advantage of causality is that not only models perform better, but they're also more explainable and transparent. Causal AI also has the ability to simulate scenarios not encountered in the past, allowing it to model counterfactual worlds to learn from, 
instead of just relying on training data. And as a result, causal AI is much more accurate than the current state of the art in machine learning. In a recent study, we showed that causal AI had an average accuracy score 42% higher than the current state of the art. The most prominent AI visionaries also agree that causal AI is the solution. For example, here, uh, Gary Marcus says, few topics in AI could be more important. Perhaps nothing else so important has been so neglected. By applying the power of causal AI to all kinds of problems, we help organizations to optimize the processes. For example, we help logistics companies that want to improve their airplane's capacity factors. By inputting past cargo data and economic indicators, the causal lens technology autonomously makes predictions of cargo demand and updates in real time, helping them optimize their fleet. Our technology can also be deployed on the edge. For example, causal lens can be fitted into turbines in a wind farm, forming an IoT ecosystem that enables them to maximize energy production. This can be further coordinated with electricity demand forecasts to help balance and optimize the energy grid. A further application is in predictive maintenance, for which causal AI's ability to accurately model different scenarios really shows its strength. Using causal AI, we've seen up to 30% reduction in maintenance costs and 5% reduction in downtime. Dozens of companies are currently using causal AI and finding great value in the unique advantages it provides, as these testimonials show. To learn more about causal AI and optimize your business, please visit us at causallens.com and follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kazolens. Amazing presentation. Now, I'm very excited to present a company that is revolutionizing the customer experience of worldwide leading companies with its low-code customer engagement platform that allows a rapid and customized deployment of our digital customer journey. Please, Adam, show us the next revolution. AirKit is a low-code, no-code platform purpose-built for digital customer experience. We help companies from the largest Fortune 500s to leading brands across every industry build on AirKit and build these digital experiences 40X faster. When we think about AirKit, we are focused on these self-service points in time that you wanna drive those experiences with customers as well as being more proactive across the entire customer life cycle. AirKit, when we talk about, and really the founding story around AirKit is how to drive these customer actions in these last mile. So we work seamlessly across CRMs, ERPs, contact center software to ultimately drive your customers to automatically onboard, to make payment updates, to uh, fill out information related to their accounts easily and seamlessly. And we connect to these systems so that it's, it's all done without needing an agent in the middle. In here, in this last mile, we are ultimately driving automation uh, and process through the journey and the customer lifecycle. The way that these are done with AirKit is that in our platform, we have reusable components. And this low code, no code experience allows for clicks, not code to create these entire customer journeys and experiences across web, uh, desktop and mobile, uh, voice, as well as messaging like SMS, WhatsApp. Inside of here, these web experiences can be built. So things like adding locations, uploading images, scheduling time, making payments, or even adding your own custom components can be done directly with AirKit, but ultimately creating that perfect experience within the customer lifecycle. And would invite you to scroll down to the bottom here uh, at the very, very bottom of our page, you can actually start to build these experiences and experience what an AirKit uh, proactive engagement might look like, a digital self-service as well as agent assist where we can augment the agent customer interaction. Proactive engagement, really good example. This is scheduling somebody if they drop out of a funnel or if you need to get some updated information from them. And so what I will do here is actually start this experience directly uh, and actually show an example of where a system like Salesforce or a CRM can actually allow you to uh, drive these proactive engagements. And so what I'll do here is I'll trigger an outbound text message, could be an email, could be a phone call, but ultimately when we actually look at my phone here, 
will actually see that I've received a text message that is branded directly to the actual customer experience. When I jump into this experience, we'll actually be able to see some of these lightweight ephemeral type journeys. I'll schedule time. And what we're doing is we're actually creating an entire orchestration. So for instance, I've actually already received that text message to remind me that tomorrow I have this confirmation. So ultimately driving this entire experience. We can also do things like deflect to self-service. So phone calls coming in, maybe I wanna actually move this towards a digital journey rather than an agent picking up a phone call in a contact center. And so what I'll do is I'll, receive, I'll make this outbound phone call. Based on our records, in order to and I'll actually press two. So rather than talking to an agent to update my account, I'll be able to do this no self-service. So inside of here, click on that link. And ultimately this is branded secure directly within the mobile experience or desktop, but allowing me to do things like make changes to my, my um, subscription, updating a payment information, and a lot of these other common components we've talked about in our platform. So I invite you all to try out these journeys on our website. These are simple examples. We're going to do everything from simple to complex, but ultimately driving this self-service and automation in the customer experience. And uh, with that, we'd like to thank you and invite you to learn more about AirKit. Thanks, Adam, for the very insightful presentation. As we are getting a better understanding of the AI and how it's going to simplify and transform our jobs or life more efficiently, some questions rise. For example, is the implementation of artificial intelligence efficient? I'm glad to present to you a team that knows the answer. Jackson is aware of the problem and has developed a solution that trains and teaches to AI how to label data. Let's, let's listen how they do it. Hello everyone, Jackson is AI for AI, focused on using AI to label data so humans don't have to. The heart of AI today are models that use labeled data to learn from. The more high quality labeled data you have, the better you're able to get highly accurate models. Currently, humans are labeling data manually one at a time and is the biggest bottleneck in the AI creation process today. Meet Jackson. Jackson automates as much of the process as possible. We're currently focused on natural language, really anything that's been written or spoken by a human, such as call logs, chat logs, emails, social media, etc. Raw text comes into an assembly line that adjusts to the domain specific data and defined problem specification. Then through a series of algorithms, an iterative cycle of human input and a number of approaches that are looking to automate as much of this process as possible, Jackson autonomously labels the data and out comes fully labeled training data. Humans can't compete. Not only are they slow and costly, they're inaccurate, they're inconsistent. I've, I've done this labeling firsthand and it becomes mind numbing. So when it comes to training these models and you're using the human labeled inputs, you're starting from an inherently flawed starting point. Typically Jackson gives significant lift to not only the labeled data, but also the models that are being trained. Use cases range from text analytics, document classification, process automation, and powering chatbots, which is actually how we started the company. Here's a case study we did with a top 10 retailer. We took 400,000 return comments and using Jackson versus the humans, we were 100 times faster, a lot more accurate, and much more cost effective. We are looking forward to exploring fit with all of you. We have a number of use cases that can fit into any number of verticals. Customer service call analytics tends to be a pretty popular use case. But as I mentioned earlier, Jackson morphs to the data itself and data science teams use it to define a problem specification that's tied to your specific use cases with your own company data all on your own infrastructure. Please reach out to info at jackson.ai or find me directly through this platform. Thank you.
Thanks, Jackson, for telling us your very exciting journey. And now is the time to cover a topic that the pandemic has helped us to ask some questions about. How do we imagine a smart and healthy workplace? I know that our sofas are comfortable enough, but in the deep of our heart, we miss the coffee machine in the office and the energy of our colleagues. Regarding that, I'm glad to invite on the Summer Summit population that is going to tell us how the future will look like with their health intelligent platform that will help businesses to improve and report the condition of their workplaces thanks to the advanced sanitization technologies, sensors, and analytics. Please, Megan, the stage is yours. Hi, I'm Megan Groves, the CEO and founder of Population, the first health security system. Biological threats are expensive. The last year and a half has cost the US $16 trillion, not to mention all the personal losses. But are we better prepared for the future? The pandemic exposed many of our weaknesses. Each year, the influenza alone cost businesses $87 billion, and the economic burden of foodborne illness tops $36 billion. Businesses have never experienced more urgency and economic pressure to secure the health of their team and customers. Healthy buildings, uncontaminated food, and improved personal safety, these are all tied to the bottom line and are areas even the most sophisticated ESG programs can't address. Let's take a closer look. Companies are already investing billions in IoT, but many are not sure how to extract its value. In fact, most of the spending is into sensors that just passively detect and report. But population believes there's a bigger opportunity in proactively resolving issues in addition to giving businesses the ability to track, test, comply, and document. We are a health intelligence platform comprised of advanced sanitization technology, sensors, and analytics. Our market entry point is a UV light that's safe for human exposure, enabled by powerful IoT capabilities. The result is a responsive system that enables businesses to better improve safety, comply with regulation, and control risk. And we have a patent portfolio on the same. The population solution deactivates up to 99.99% of harmful viruses and bacteria in undisturbed environments and works across pathogens found in kitchens, conference rooms, waiting rooms, points of sale, and other shared spaces. It's configurable in three different ways and provides always on protection, constantly sanitizing in the background. It provides critical intelligence for business managers to make daily decisions and track their sanitization efforts over time and offers a tool that integrates with the company's other IoT and analytics initiatives. Let's take a look at some real world examples. Population is creating a new category at the intersection of a massive opportunity, reaching into the prop tech, health tech, and even food tech segments. Today, we capture sanitization and corporate wellness budgets. Tomorrow, we carve into a company's IoT and ESG budgets. We are emerging out of stealth mode with a product ready to sell and are feverishly working to expand our platform capabilities. And throughout the timeline of the plug and play program, we've managed to complete rigorous lab tests, validate our product in two controlled pilots, and develop our customer base. We are pleased to launch with over 30 customers in our pipeline across the prop tech, smart cities, food prep, and other sectors. By the end of this year, we'll be in two high visibility global landmarks, and we're negotiating key distributor deals in the US and East Asia markets. Our business model is a monthly hardware software blend that starts with an upfront implementation fee, followed by a monthly recurring revenue based on square feet or zones of coverage. That includes the physical product, software, data, education and marketing, and annual servicing to keep our customers happy. We are serial entrepreneurs, technical product experts, and brand builders, and know how to launch and scale companies. Our team comes from Molecule, Cruise, and Facebook Reality Labs, and we're supported by an advisory board that includes leading public health and food safety experts. The Plug and Play Smart Cities IoT program has been a great opportunity, and now we're raising our seed to scale, and we'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure sharing with you today, and please reach out if you or your firm or your fund is interested in collaborating. Really interesting. Thanks, Megan. We all know that people in businesses are the most important resource, and we all experience how mental well-being is important into our professional life for productivity and happiness. To this topic, I will invite Ivan Palomino and the Besson team 
to present how they are businesses to improve the mental well-being of the employees. My name is Ivan Palomino. I am one of the co-founders of Besson. We are based in the United Arab Emirates. Now, I think that we all agree well-being is not a new topic, but I think corporate caring about it is even more with the current pandemic. Many may not be aware, but actually for every $1 you invest in well-being, you get $5 back as an employer. The cost of not investing in your employees is about $2,300 that you would lose in productivity, presenteeism, or any other illness that your employee would have because of that pain point. The problem is that if you don't know what you don't know as a head of learning in a corporate, you don't know how to fix it. And this has a cost. Putting a voice in the 91% suffering and saying nothing and a solution to fixing the problem would save our clients and future clients millions. We have found a market fit We've been in the market for about 12 months here in the Middle East, and we have validated with employees and industries. Very simply put, it is the industries in which is the most expensive to have unproductive employees. And if you look at our current base of customers, they are exactly there. We are a B2B to C company where for employers, we provide them a dashboard with analytics in order for them to see the progress that their employees are making and for employees, an app-based solution that provides them on-the-go content that is personalized. This is also reflected in our business uh, model. When we go out and sell to companies, we first sell them a pilot of our workshop, something that they understand, something that they know. And as a result, having that personal touch of a workshop typically opens doors. Shifting the companies from one-off revenues to a recurrent base one. There are startups in the well being, and we do believe we have a differentiator compared to them with our learning methodology backed up by science. However, one of the things that we will double down in the next 12 months is location, location, location. We are one of the first movers in the Middle East and already a successful tech startup in that space. The Middle East is one of the lowest areas in the world in terms of mental health awareness incorporated, and is where learning and development is expanding quite a lot. Therefore, we focus on our niche and on the market to become a leader and expand from there. If people will not talk about it, we will talk about it. Already today, we have both been highly covering tier one media and we have our own social media in order to control the communication and acquire, a, have an acquisition funnel of clients. The company is well experienced, we are profitable, we are growing, and that's because myself and my co-founder, Elena, have been working in corporate and well-being for the last 12 years. Our joint experience is the one making the core team at best and possible today. And we are now looking to expand the team in order to achieve our mission to train 1 million people in the next 12 months and be ready for Series E. Hey, now we are looking to raise 200,000 dollars in order to increase our revenue by eight in 12 months and make it recurrent with our subscription model. Contact us or simply book a time about to discuss about the opportunity to be involved in well-being and learn from Besson. Thank you so much, Ivan. We love your energy. The next company is going to revolutionize the back office of many industries. They found the secret sauce to unlock the human potential to simplify and automate the document processing thanks to their deep learning algorithm that is able to classify the information with a no-code technology. Sam, I will pass the mic to you. Hi, everyone. I'm Jem. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer at Hyptos. We serve global leaders in manufacturing, retail, real estate, and more than 300 software companies that white label our technology. We automate document processing for enterprises. Companies have low automation rates for documents transmitted as images, which leads to expensive operations and costly mistakes. For example, in accounts payable, 45% of payments are due to avoidable mistakes like duplicate or fraudulent documents, missing out on early payment discounts, and not noticing price hikes on line item level. Let's see it in action. 
Our product team will show how our solution works on any document. And please reach out to me regarding process automation or if you are looking into investing in our Series A. Thank you. Today we would like to show how clients can use Hyperto Studio as a no-code document automation platform. Let's assume that there's a new document that we need to process, residence permits for example. We first need to create a project to train a deep learning model for this document type. Different OCR languages can be used and it can be assigned to different users and models. Finally, the fields that need to be captured as part of this model need to be defined. There's already a list of predefined fields available, but you are also free to create customized fields. For our residence <coughs> permit, we are defining the fields name, surname, and two ID fields. You can assign a data type to the field like amount, date, and many more. You can also set some fields as required. The project can now be created. To kick off, we first need to upload one document to train the model because we do not yet have a model for residence permits. Initially, we will not be able to extract any data. We need to guide the machine to build the model. You can see the document on the left-hand side and the fields that have been defined earlier on the right-hand side. The relevant fields on the document can be annotated by highlighting them in the document image. And that was all the annotation work that needed to be done in order to train the model. The model training will take about one and a half to two minutes. During this time, the neural network weights are being recalculated to make sure that we can process similar documents. Please note that this training is not a training from scratch. Our models have already seen millions of documents and we use that prior knowledge using transfer learning to build new accurate document models. I can see that the training is completed now. I will upload another document and this time the model will make predictions and it will convert the image to machine readable format. Here, we can see that the OCR is being completed and after that extraction is being completed. You can now see the second document that has been uploaded. As you can see, we can correctly extract all the details from this document, even though it looks significantly different than the document that we annotated before. This is because the model can generalize from a single example. This was a short demo with a simple document. We have pre-trained models for highly variable documents like orders, invoices, payment reminders. By annotating a few examples, users can train models for highly variable documents like medical records, rate sheets, and so on. Hyperdoc Studio is the no-code document automation platform for enterprises. All right, I passed the amazing presentation. And now, if you practice yoga and you are aware of the importance of briefing and the quality of the air, Cities and organizations are putting a lot of effort to improve the quality of the air of their citizens and the employees. And I believe that you will find very interesting how our next speaker, Barrys, that is going to present a solution for high quality analysis and monitoring to implement concrete actions to improve it. Hello, this is Barish from Aircon. Now I'm going to present you our solution, Aircon, a hyperlocal air pollution management system. There is no doubt that air pollution is considered as a global health problem. And here are some facts on this particular issue. Over 90% of world population lives in areas where, world, where pollution levels are above the preferred guideline for healthy air. Only less than a billion people breathe clean air in a daily basis. Thus, air pollution caused 6.67 million premature deaths across the world in just 2019. It accounts 12% of all deaths worldwide. And in order to solve this huge problem, two things need to be considered. Air pollution needs to be properly monitored and understood. And, but monitoring and understanding air quality is expensive and complex. It is expensive. Nowadays, cities use bulky and expensive monitors, huge monitors to monitor the air pollutants. These monitors are super accurate, but due to its massiveness and size and cost, they do not satisfy the current needs. And that is why they cannot be scaled to sufficiently monitor a city continuously. And it is actually quite complex. Two locations distance with 250 meters can have eightfold air quality differences. As Aircon, our, our goal is to create an environmental intelligence platform to monitor, analyze, and manage the air around us. Our solution consists of four building blocks which are monitoring, visualization, analytics, and action plans. We monitor the air with low-cost, low-powered, and energy self-sufficient sensor units 
and aggregate the data in the Aircon cloud. They are thousand times cheaper than the bulk stations. We then visualize this data using custom tools and present in a user-friendly and comprehensible manner. Analytics is the backbone of our system. We analyze the data collected by our sensors in order to be able to predict the air pollution levels in the future. We can also be able to identify the source of air pollution per pollutants. One of the main concerns to use a monitoring system like ours is accuracy. Thanks to our smart calibration algorithm, we increase the accuracy of our air sensor units significantly. We have proven our results working locally with our Ministry of Environment and Metropolitan Municipality and technical universities. We are lucky to work with them. There is a quite huge market for air pollution insights. Insurance, real estate, shipping, and cement industries are the ones that are eager to use air pollution data into their decision-making processes. Local authorities became, be, became the main source of demand as they started to take these new generation measurement systems into consideration by adding them into their air quality regulations. Here's a snapshot of one of our deployments. We have deployed a sensor network in our local city, Istanbul, and currently track the pollutants in the air and generate heat maps per pollutant, predict future concentration of pollutants, and try to identify the source of air pollution. We also provide reports to help them to understand the behavior of the pollutants and propose policies to mitigate effects. Here are some of the customers that currently we are working on. Municipalities, system integrators, NGOs, and universities. We work with our customers as if they are partners. All the work that we have done cannot be realized with the core focus team. But my brother, Dennis, and Orkun, we were also together with our previous IoT startup. We transfer all the know-how in just six months and came up with a state-of-the-art air pollution measurement system. We also plan next steps with our advisors who are the thought leaders of the, their related fields. Thanks a lot for listening. We are in a funding round now. If you are interested in air pollution, please feel free to contact us. Thanks, Barrys. We would love to see it in our everyday life soon. To the audience, a quick reminder, please, vote for your uh, favorite startup in our pool and that, that will be announced during the next week uh, via LinkedIn. But now, ladies and gen gentlemen of Plug and Play ecosystem, let's take a short break from the startup pitches and let's listen to a very exciting story about innovation. Before listening to that story, I would like to invite here on the Summer Summit stage, a woman that has a leading position in bringing innovation within global businesses. The person I'm talking about is Jackie Hernandez, founding member of Plug and Play, senior vice president of global partnerships and global leader of the greatest innovation ecosystem around the globe. She's going to be the moderator in a five-star chat with another special guest. Let's welcome her with a great applause on the chat. Thank you so much, Leonardo. It's a pleasure to have you and, and thank you so much for for giving us the opportunity and everybody welcome good morning my name is jackie hernandez uh, uh, svp global partnerships and i have today the pleasure of welcoming ben albo vice president of digital products and businesses and chief product officers of wesco international uh, ben albo joined wesco in 2003 and has served in leading positions that expand from financial services director to VP of Mergers and Acquisitions, Strategy and Innovation, to VP of Digital Transformation. Ben holds a bachelor degree in Materials Engineering and an MBA in Finance from the University of Cincinnati. Ben, it is a pleasure to welcome you today and you're joining us from sunny Hawaii, right? I am this morning. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here in Hawaii. I, I, I will, I will uh, be a little bit dishonest and say I would much rather be in Northern California, but if I had to be anywhere in Northern yeah, California, no. <laughs> it certainly would be at the, at the plug and play offices, which I, I haven't seen in a year and a half, but I can't wait to get back to. So thanks for having me this morning. No, it is a pleasure. It, it is unbelievable. I mean, 18 years uh, with the organization. Did they hire you when you were four? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I thank you for the compliment. Uh, I have spent the majority of my career at Wesco. I did spend a little bit of time before, uh, before joining at a global consultancy, and I started my career as a research and development engineer um, uh, for medical devices at Johnson & Johnson, of all things. But yes, it's been a wonderful ride at Wesco. I've enjoyed all 18 years, and Hopefully I'll get at least 18 more. 
That is so wonderful. Can you tell us a little bit of what is Wesco, their global values and vision, and what are their goals? Yeah, absolutely. So it, it, I get this question from my four kids all the time as well, because Wesco is not a brand that um, that uh, that is widely known in the consumer space. We're not a consumer company. We're one of those very large enterprise B2B companies um, that you've heard of, and you're probably very familiar with if you're in our space, but if you're not, you may not have heard of us. So we're 18,000 employees worldwide, 150,000 customers, and just uh, around 17 billion in revenue. We have 800 locations in about 50 countries, brick and mortar around 50 countries around the world. And the way to think about us is we're everything electrical, data communications, broadband, security, networking, and electrical utility. And we have a broad range of services and products. It would take the full 15 minutes for me to go through even, even to scratch the surface on many of them. But our, but our legacy is a brand that many folks may be familiar with. Wesco at one period of time stood for Westinghouse Electric Supply Company. We were the captive sales and distribution arm of the Westinghouse Corporation. And still today, we're headquartered in, in my hometown when I'm not, uh, when I'm not uh, here in Hawaii of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And uh, we're, it's, a, it's an absolute pleasure to be here to mo this morning to share a little bit of the story of our innovation journey with the team. That is so incredible. And of course, everybody is familiar with the name Westinghouse, but uh, people don't know how much it has evolved and especially how much innovation plays a role inside of the organization. Now, you come from a very massive merger with Annexter that double your size. I mean, if it was not big enough, it really, you went double, you put together a couple of organizations with somewhat different uh, uh, cultures. Um, how do you prioritize innovation and, and how does innovation look like in your company? Yeah, great question. And first and foremost, surprising, we're about a year into our into our merger with Annexter, and we closed a year ago in July, so we're, we're 11 months in. It's been striking actually how remarkably similar the cultures are. We were we were competitors, and we had similar business models and similar customers and similar products, but the cultures were actually quite similar as well, and that's led to our to our integration. Both companies valued innovation. Uh, with 150,000 combined customers, one of the ways to think about what we do is we we innovate for our customers. Our sales teams, which about 50% of our organization is customer facing on a daily basis, meaning they interact with customers every day. We develop bespoke solutions and bespoke services and bring our suppliers products to market in ways that create value for our customers. That's probably the most generic way that I can describe what we do. And we do it many, many, many different ways. And we have a history of innovation inside of the company. In fact, I joined when I, as, as, you, as you joked, when I was four years old to help launch Lean as a continuous improvement methodology yeah. inside of the company 18 years ago. We were the very first global distributor to our knowledge. We were the very first global distributor to apply Lean or the Toyota manufacturing system as a means of continuous improvement. And we did it back then 18 years ago. And we're still very, very much have lean core to our culture today is a means of identifying value for our customers, focusing on it and then delivering it in the most efficient way possible. Around five years ago, we started really deliberately focusing on business model innovation. And in particular, using concepts such as design thinking and expanding our innovation ecosystem with partners like Plug and Play to come at it from a slightly different angle, looking at new sources of value, not just improving on the sources of value that we have today. And so it's critical to our organization it's critical to our success. Every company is going to say that innovation is important to them. I've not met one um, that hasn't. With that said, I, being part of Wesco now for 18 years, I can point to hundreds of examples of where without innovative thinking and innovative approaches, we wouldn't be in the leadership position that we're in today. And so I, it's it's critical to us and it's critical to have good partners like Plug and Play. Oh, that's the, thank you so very much. How did you come to meet Plug and Play? How did it happen? Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful story. We uh, we were, as I mentioned, uh, looking at how we could use innovation um, to drive value for our organization. We had a new member to our board of directors just a few years ago, um, and he had a relationship with Plug and Play. And when he he saw our corporate strategy was being oriented onto our board, he immediately reached out to um, our chairman and CEO, uh, as well as myself and a few other members of senior management and said, you have to expand your innovation ecosystem. I love the strategy. I love the direction of the company. In fact, he said it's one of the reasons he joined our board. 
but he was, he said, I think I can help you move faster. And I think I can help you move with more efficiency and have, um, have more insight into what's going on in the world around you, particularly from a technology perspective. And so he brought us out to, uh, to his offices uh, in, in Northern California and Silicon Valley. And one of the very first meetings on the very first day that we took was with plug and play and uh, immediately saw the value in terms of helping to um, launch and expand our, our innovation ecosystem. And for the past two and a half years, it's been a, it's been a wonderful relationship. Well, thank you. That's incredible to hear. And so, of course, um, um, we deal with startups day in and day out. So, so uh, what is the startup, uh, the role of the startups in your innovation roadmap? And, and how do you define success when you work with them? Yeah, a wonderful question. So there are multiple roles that startups play in our innovation ecosystem. One is we have, uh, as I mentioned, 150,000 customers. We have tens of thousands of suppliers as well that we bring to market. We've seen many opportunities for startups to be part of our, our supply chain ecosystem that we bring to our customers collectively. We've got many examples of, of relationships that we've formed from innovation office that have turned into supply relationships of us bringing their solution to our mutual customers. That's probably the most traditional way, if I can say it that way, that we work with startups. We also look at startups to help to fuel our internal innovation agenda and to fill holes in our technology blueprint and uh, technology roadmap that can't be met with, uh, with large players or with our internal technology teams. And so we see tremendous opportunity to plug startups that we meet with into the four walls of our business to help us run more efficiently and more effectively, as well as extend their products and services to our customers, and also, candidly, is a source of innovation, a, a continuous reminder of the art of the possible, how it's possible to move with incredible speed, what it really means to take an agile approach to development and an agile approach to thinking, to, to, to use modern tools and approaches such as the you know, business model canvas and design thinking. These are all things for many large 100 year corporates like Wesco is that aren't necessarily as um, front of mind and as front of center as it is for a startup, it particularly maybe a startup that's uh, got a founder that's on their second or third or fourth turn and knows how to do things. It's right. been incredibly, it's been incredibly um, uh, 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 educational for members of our management team, as well as our frontline employees that have had an opportunity to engage with the startups that we've met through our innovation ecosystem. That is right. And, and, and also, I mean, working with startups is, is kind of like an iteration work. It's, uh, I mean, people think that it is almost magic and it happens uh, perfectly yeah. every time. And, and uh, it is not precisely like that. Can you tell us, I mean, really, how does it work when things don't go as expected and when things go as expected? Do we have you, Ben? I think he froze. Oh, again, can you hear me, Ben? Can, it might be on my oh. end. Um, yeah. Can you hear me now? No, I was just, uh, yeah, we hear you. Uh, was just, let, let, let me let me hear? do yeah, yeah, no, I, I think I got the gist of the question. Let me do the most common thing that's happened to all of us over the past year and a half with COVID, which is yell at my kids to get off the the, the broadband for one second. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course, we have done that. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was the everybody off the network uh, 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 cry here, uh, which, by the way, a quick plug for the Rural Broadband Opportunity Fund, the RDA fund that the federal government is making available, U.S. federal government, $20 billion to bring rural uh, broadband to underserved communities, a big opportunity for Wesco. We're a major player and fully supportive of it. Um, and uh, the, I will use it here in a, a rural part of the Big Island of Hawaii that I'm currently in. I'm certain to, to improve the Internet connectivity. Um, yeah, it doesn't always go. Uh, you know, as, as, as well as you hope, Jackie, it is, I think as ho hopefully everybody is aware of, and it, I would encourage all the corporates here to embrace. Um, I like to think that if you're batting 200 or 300, you're, you're, you're batting really well, meaning if 20 to 30% of the engagements with startups end up exactly like you best possibly thought that they would, that's probably about the right statistic. And in fact, the real, the real question is, how do you get value for you and the startup? out of the 70 to 80% that don't go exactly according to plan? How do you help them evolve their journey 
and you know, get to the scaling and the next round of funding for the startup. And from a corporate perspective, how do we get value out of the experience? Um, and we had a recent experience with a great startup, phenomenal group of folks, um, well-funded by the way, and they're doing really well, but it didn't go exactly as planned for, for either of us. It was actually a, a, a COVID related, um, a COVID related technology around uh, 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 social distancing uh, for construction job sites. We're a major provider to, uh, to construction uh, job sites all around the world. And one of our best contractor partners, a customer of ours um, in us went into a partnership to investigate social distancing and IoT social distancing solution at job sites. Uh, and it was a challenge. Um, you know, it was a challenge trying to execute it during the early days of COVID. It was a challenge with an unproven technology, um, a proven technology, I should say, but an unproven application of the technology um, and getting the right integrator partners from the startup onto the job site in that environment proved to be very, very challenging. Ultimately, we weren't fully successful at, at being able to leverage the technology for its intended consequences, but there was a value that we, we, we received and the startup received. The startup was able to get to the job site, actually three very large construction job sites across, across the US. Uh, we were able to bring to a customer who's a major partner of ours, a solution, a really unique spoke solution that wasn't even necessary three to four months prior, let alone contemplated. Uh, yeah. And we were able to show in good faith that we were attempting to help them evolve to their business needs. And uh, ultimately, at the end of the day, the technology wasn't fully successful in the application, but all parties benefited from the experience. That is incredible. And then you have the other side of the story, right? When things go as you expected. So uh, do you have a case like that? Yeah, absolutely. Hopefully we have a handful of those and we continue to add to that, that uh, basket going forward. But one that comes fresh to mind is um, being a, a, a distribution company, a logistics and distribution company, a supply chain company. Uh, we have a number, a very large number of trucks that are on the road every day, vehicles that are driving around, making deliveries to customers, picking up, picking up products as well. Um, and driver safety, vehicle safety is absolute utmost paramount's important for our organization. And when you have a large number of vehicles on the road like we do, accidents do happen. And so we're always on the lookout for training and technology that can help make our, our delivery fleet and our drivers more safe and to get them home to their families at the end of the day in the same way that they came into work in the morning. And we recently, a couple of years ago, were, um, were introduced to a startup, uh, an IoT startup, that has a hardware device and a SaaS solution that sits in the cab of a vehicle and assists the driver as well as management in identifying safer driving behaviors and also helps helps them stay focused on the road and also helps to um, uh, to uh, uh, to record uh, information in the case of an incident or accident. Uh, we deployed that on a POC, a, a proof of concept basis, about a year and a half ago, shortly before COVID, um, and it, the results were very positive. Uh, and we've been able to over the last year and oh, a half cool. during COVID period of time, scale that across uh, the majority of our delivery feet in, in, in the U.S. markets. Um, and it's been well received by, uh, by our drivers um, as, well as, uh, as well as our management team. Uh, and it's having uh, market improvements already in terms of the driver safety uh, and vehicle safety that we see on the road. That's awesome. We're running almost out of time, but perhaps if you could tell us like a quick recommendation either for the corporations or the startups in the audience, what would you tell them today? Wow, <laughs> in less than a minute, I would say- In less than a minute. <laughs> I would say keep at it. Um, I, I think, you know, I hear this all the time from, from friends uh, in the, you know, in our innovation ecosystem of um, maybe misunderstandings around uh, the expectation of what the, the batting average should be for working on, on innovation topics in general, but also working with startups. I, I'd say look for value in every interaction. Look to, look to find a way to move forward and continue to, to, to grind it out on a daily basis. It will not, they will not all result in things you want to put into a PowerPoint deck and show the board of directors. Right. And um, it is not that all, fast, right? It is not. It, 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 you should always make, try and make it as fast as possible um, and take an iterative, agile approach, certainly, and look, identify value in the eyes of the customer. Uh, but be prepared for challenges and you know, set expectations appropriately. That is wonderful. And that advice, I think it will resonate with all of our audience. Ben, I thank you so much, especially for making that effort to wake up super early today, directly from Hawaii. And thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.
very insightful conversation, Jack and Ben. I believe that everyone who has is going back to, from this event with a better understanding and with a benchmark on how to implement innovation in organizations. So thank you very much. And we would love like to give you like a great applause and, and we hope like to give in, in, uh, in presence soon. And after this uh, fireside chat, you can't forget to vote for the startup that you like most. We would like to see what has captured your attention also after this uh, uh, amazing conversation. And now let's continue with a deep dive into the section of hardware and advanced products. The first company that I would like to invite is a company that has developed a solution to provide aluminum by a novel additive manufacturing process. Please, Andy, tell us more on that. Hi, I'm Andy Bedell, co-founder and COO at Alloy Enterprises. We're developing a novel additive manufacturing process for aluminum. So aluminum has seen some significant growth over the past few years. So, uh, much of this due to the e-mobility and lightweighting uh, industries. All of this is still driven by uh, casting. And casting having 12 week lead times means our innovations and new products cannot get into the field fast enough. 3D printing was aimed to solve this by having an on-demand manufacturing and benefits with complex geometries and simplified supply chain. But the reality is, is that the powder is still 100 to 150 times the cost of raw material. The technologies themselves are also uh, have a tendency to have poor fatigue strength and lower throughput due to the challenges in oxidation. Alloy is taking a different approach to this. Uh, by using a sheet-based technology. So you imagine a system dispensing and a laser cutting the perimeter of the part. Uh, this already gives us a massive speed advantage. So being able to stack these layers and bond them in a separate system uh, allows us to make fully dense parts. And we also have the ability to inhibit bonding so that we can make fully three-dimensional parts. So the end result is we're able to produce 6061 and offer an on-demand production at the unit cost of casting. Our workflow here is being able to convert the 3D models and slice that into layers for our system. You can see this part uh, right out of the supports and a cross section which show the internal channels. The high magnification with the layers overlay show you where the lines would have been so that we can produce fully dense homogeneous parts. We believe this is a cost compelling technology for manufacturing. We have done comparisons against conventional manufacturing and additive technologies and believe this is a suitable option for both low and medium volumes. A quick snapshot of our timeline here. We are looking at fulfilling part orders by the end of this year with commercially available systems a year or so after that. The impact that we can have here is uh, certainly an improved aftermarket. So as I mentioned, the 12 weeks and $18,000 in tooling may make sense for an initial production run, but as you start to end of life these products, uh, it just does not become justified. For new product applications, we're very interested in integrated cooling channels for electronics, assembly consolidation, and lightweighting your parts. So removing some of this material that uh, comes with conventional manufacturing. Uh, looking forward to chatting everyone about your applications and how Alloy can help. Thank you. Very interesting, Andy. The next company that is going to present offers a digital sensing solution to seamlessly integrate hardware and software with mechanical and fluidic components. If you need to sense the air or gas, they are the person to talk to. Please, Andrea, welcome on stage. Hi everyone, it's a pleasure for me to be here, but uh, time is short. I only have three minutes. Uh, I really don't want to waste your time either. So if you are an engineer and need to measure airflow, listen carefully because we can make your life easy. If you are a manager and airflow is critical to your product, keep listening because we can give you an edge. Also, if you are looking into environmental sensing solutions, write down my details and get in touch. What we are developing in our labs might really surprise you. And to all the art tech investors out there, you should listen to if you want to grow with us, because we'll start fundraising soon. Anyone else? I'm afraid this is not for you. We are a semiconductor company based on a fabulous business model, developing flow sensing solutions 
for high volume, low cost applications. Originally spun off from Cambridge University. We are based in Cambridge, UK, with reps in Hong Kong and US. We are a team of about 25 people, mostly engineers. Recently, ASO 1001 certified, we grew where we are with about five and a half million investments. We launched our first product in Q4 last year and really going into production next quarter. So currently transitioning from a product development into a sales phase. Our first product, the FLS 110, is the world's smallest airflow sensor. The photo here is to scale. It's, it's a really tiny product with a footprint of just three and a half by three and a half millimeters. Clearly, size is one of our USPs. The sensor can fit into virtually any product and within a product where measuring flow matters the most. We didn't only design a sensor switch which can be produced in high volumes using typical semiconductor supply chain, but we also designed it such that it's suitable for automated assembly into the end product. The flow sensor is based on a thermal principle, does no moving parts for robustness and performance. It also borrows from our suppliers all the quality typical of the semiconductor industry. Our second US split is integration flexibility. We provide our customers with a complete digital flow sensing solution comprising not only the sensor component, but also a full suite of reference designs covering electronics, firmware, mechanical and fluidic integration aspects. This modular approach gives you the power to strike the ideal balance between performance and system costs. Due to its size and flexibility, the FLS 110 can be used in a variety of applications. It doesn't really matter in which market you are in. If you have hair moving in your product and need to sense it for improved safety, energy efficiency, or user experience, we are the ones you want to talk to. And of course, we have everything you need to try the FLS 110 yourself in form of an evaluation kit. Now, get in touch. Talk to you soon. Thanks, Andrea. Great presentation. The last company of this section has developed an innovative coating that dramatically reduces ice addition strength, outperforming other advanced coatings while maintaining durability, chemical, and UV stability. Be careful, that doesn't mean you can put your tank on a frozen street drum, but then it means that can, they can help you if you do that. Brian, I will pass the mic to you. Hi, my name is uh, Brian Huskinson. I'm the CEO of Elemental Coatings, and we're a company devoted to solving problems caused by ice and scale. Um, just to put a little bit of context around the scope of the issue, um, every, every time a large passenger jet is de-iced, uh, it costs $13,000. Uh, global spend on de-icing fluids by commercial airlines exceeds $800 million a year, and that's just on the de-icing fluid. It's not uh, on the equipment or the labor or whatever cost you would assign to you know, frustrated and, and delayed passengers. Um, there are over 10 million megawatt hours of lost energy production in the wind uh, space as turbines are shut down when ice builds up on the blades. Um, this copper costs operators over a billion dollars a year and also puts several million extra tons of CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, and then one last example here, um, there are over 20,000 slip and fall injuries in the U.S. each year uh, caused by ice or snow. Um, these... Um, slip and fall injuries on average cost over $40,000 per claim. So overall, um, we think there's a three plus billion dollar addressable market um, for better ice management across various sectors of the economy. So how do we address this problem? Simply put, we have a coating that makes it difficult for ice to stick to surfaces. Um, I've started a, a video here on, on the right side of the screen, and you can see that middle step is, is coated with our technology and the others aren't. And you'll see how much easier it is to remove um, the code, remove ice from a surface um, that's been coated with, with our paints. Um, it is a passive coating. It looks, feels, and, and functions like a normal paint. You can spray it on, you can brush it on, you can roll it on. We sell it in, in cans um, as, as you would buy any other paint, but it has this extra remarkable property of making it difficult for ice to stick. It also has very good durability and stability um, against uh, you know, most chemicals and, and UV. And the IP is licensed exclusively from the University of Houston. 
Um, another video just want to want to show you here. This is some work we're doing with uh, defense subcontractors around the F-35. Um, you can see the top blade is coated, uh, the bottom is uncoated, and you'll see the difference in the frequency and extent of ice shedding events. Overall, we get roughly a 4x reduction in the amount of ice buildup uh, on, in this uh, icing wind tunnel test. So just a little bit about traction to date and where we're headed. So I mentioned the F-35 work. We also have uh, uh, several active projects with Boeing, one on the B-52 bomber and one on rotorcraft. As part of that work, we have passed rain erosion tests, which are sort of the gold standard durability test in the aerospace sector. Um, we've also been successful in winning um, uh, federal grant dollars to, to fund our aerospace work. Uh, moving forward, we're looking to raise uh, $2 million to expand our, our product offerings and to into other markets and also to continue to improve our products. Um, final note about the team, you can see me there on the left. I spent five years at McKinsey, did a PhD at Harvard, and then our CTO is a faculty member um, at U of H and co-inventor of the technology. And we have a handful of engineers on staff. Um, so with that, uh, here's my contact info and thank you for your time. So nice, Brian. Now, let's jump into the final section of the summit before the networking session. As you know, repetitive tasks in a decade are going to be replaced by artificial intelligence and robotics. The factories and the production site we know today won't be the same tomorrow. It will be completely different the day after tomorrow. I don't know if it happened also to you, but I felt so happy having an intelligent robot that is helping me to keep my house cleaned I'm sure that many managers will be happy or more than happy to see such a change in their production operation. Let's open the Smart Factory session with Martina and Covariant AI that are going to tell us about a solution that will teach to robots to see, to reason, and to act with the world around us. Martina, please tell us more on that. Hi, everyone. I'm Martina Hansen, and I'm on the business development team at Covariant. Quivarian is a Silicon Valley AI robotics software company that builds universal AI for robotic automation in warehouses. You can think of our software as providing the brains behind the robot, allowing the robot to learn on the go and successfully manipulate objects in new and unstructured environments. There are two key ideas I wanna leave you with today. First is that we are entering an exciting new era of robotic automation and it's being empowered by robots that use AI. Second, I wanna share with you why I think you should strongly consider partnering with Covariant for your AI and robotic strategy. So what's new about this next wave of automation? In the photo on the left, you see an auto manufacturing plant where you see robots that have been around for over 50 years or so doing the same repetitive tasks over and over again. These robots are tireless and they do a very good job at what they're supposed to, but they're unsuited for so many other types of tasks. Things on the right, like order picking, decanting, singulation, kitting, all of these use cases have thus far remained unsolved for one simple reason. There's an infinite amount of variability. Every new object that you pick in a warehouse could be a brand new skew, could be in a strange position, could be reflecting light in a weird way. There's so many different types of variability that can occur, which means you can't just have a robot do repeatable motions over and over. The key concept is that it doesn't work to pre-program a robot, and you instead need an intelligent robot that can learn from its experiences, improve on the fly, and adapt to what it sees. So these robots aren't just in the lab anymore. They're actually being deployed in real world environments fulfilling real world customer orders. I'm excited to share with you some videos here of covariant robots in action, doing use cases like order picking, pocket induction, and put to light. The notable thing here is that these robots are operating autonomously, meaning they're operating at human level performance for full shifts with minimal human intervention. This is what's required in order to achieve the throughput that your business requires and a strong ROI. Last, let me leave you with why you should strongly consider partnering with Covariant for your AI and robotics strategy. 
First, Covariant was founded by four of the world leading AI researchers, and one third of our employees are researchers who are big contributors to the very AI advances at enabling this technology. Second, at Covariant, we're building a universal brain to power all robotics use, case, use cases across your facility. We're not looking to sell you a single solution that can only do one thing, but rather to be the AI backbone that can power all robotics use cases that you may encounter. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, we would love to explore with you how we could support you on your AI and robotics journey. My contact info is below and I look forward to discussing further with you. Thank you. Brilliant, Martina. That's amazing. Always in the robotics space, I'm glad to present a company that has the purpose to bring automation in every aspect of the business operations. Sanders and Wacko Robotics are able to select and execute the robotic solution for your needs. Welcome to our summit, Sanders. Hello, everyone. My name is Xander, the founder of Vaco Robotics. Uh, happy to be here. Today is all about um, mobile robots in production and warehousing. Uh, we're an independent player helping our customers to navigate this field, right? So as you all know, there's, there's a robot revolution coming. Um, it, you would be amazed to see how much material handling in production and warehousing is still being do ma done manually. And, and there are all these kind of different solutions out there that are helping to automate those processes, right? But there are still a couple of problems to be solved in, or, solved in order to make sure that that's really being adopted at scale. And that's where we come in. So we're robot vendor independent. We're helping our customers to identify use cases for robot automation. Here you see a typical warehouse with all kinds of different processes and to basically help them to select the right robot vendor that suits their needs. Another thing that we're doing is that we found out that after robot deployment, you are not done, right? It's not that it's all kind of running and everybody's super excited and happy. You need to actively manage this fleet of robots in order to make sure that utilization is being maximized. That's, that's where we come in with our second product, VacuSense. So just summarizing this, right? So if you look at this as a robot automation journey, starting with exploration, robot selection, buying the first robots, testing them, and then once you're kind of integrated, then it's all about managing and optimizing the robot fleet. And there we have two products. So let's start with the first one, lots of bots, a robot comparison website that can be found um, online. Uh, there are more than 200 different robots that are being listed there and you uh, can have a great overview and basically boil down this entire selection by, for example, selecting use cases or by looking at things as uh, what kind of certificates do these robots have? So this is a great entry gateway to, to orientate basically. And, and you know, if you need help, you basically get in touch with us and we, we, we walk you through this and we help you to find the best robot vendor. The second thing is VacuSense. It's a software product, software as a service, agnostic, works with any kind of robot. And this basically helps you to get most out of your multi-vendor robot fleet, right? So what kind of features do we have? Um, features such as alerting, incident management for the people on the floor working with the robots day in, day out. Second category is people are doing technical planning, uh, looking into the performance of the system, what can be optimized, should I add robots, do I have sufficient capacity, yes or no. Third category is more management level, like what kind of ROI am I getting, was it worth the investment, does it make sense to basically roll out this solution across multiple sites. And all of this results in higher utilization, better uptime, and less work doing all kinds of management reporting and number crunching because VacuSense is doing that for you. So if this is of interest to you, and if you want to learn more about mobile robots and what kind of chances it might uh, bring to you as a company, then please get in touch with us. I would be super happy to talk to you. Um, email address is down there. Thanks so much and have a great day and, uh, and hope to talk to you. Bye. Fantastic, Sanders. Thank you very much. As we know, supply chain is a critical point for many businesses and having a view of what happened within our organization is always critical. The company that is going to present provides a full hand-to-hand -hand solution that collects insights on the real world through sensor and a secure software platform for transparency. 
cost reduction, and decision making. Alexa, show us what Moico can do. Hi, my name is Alexa, and I'm co founder of Moico. As you know, the supply chain is fragmented, and every stakeholder holds their own piece of information about the product that goes from producer to end customer. Here at Moeco, we have figured out a way to make the life cycle of the product from being manufacturing to being used as a whole process with a single trust of data. So we monitor the, the sensitive goods from the point of origin throughout the logistics, storage conditions until it's being opened. We target the sensitive goods manufacturers who are actually taking risks when they send over their products. And um, we also work with logistics and packaging companies to resell the data about the product life cycle. So how do we make it possible? The product itself looks like this. Uh, it is the simple sensor sticker that is being attached to the uh, products. Usually it's on the box or shipment level. And there are two types of um, uh, tracking that we can do. Real time, when companies can make actions, for example, change routes or um, advice to their distributors that something got, went wrong or react when that's a data logger and it tracks the products all the way and they just can uh, backwards understand what's going on and how can they optimize their supply chain with the help of real data. How we're different from our competitors. Most of the, all of the companies that provide this uh, tracking solutions, they would not focus on a shipment level. They would focus on container, pallets, etc. So in order to track the sensitive products in a perfect manner, understanding their uh, temperature, humidity, vibration, all the risks, we have to go down to the product level. So that we're tracking on the product level and we're also providing a, a disposable sensors, which go one way and there is no reverse logistics of the sensors. And the very most unique feature about us is that we provide 100% data ownership to the client, the product manufacturer. Uh, the core of our product is the software platform that gathers the data and uh, is sending the notification uh, to the client if everything, if anything goes wrong. And also we route the data into the existing IT infrastructures. Uh, as I said, two types of sensor, real-time data logging, and then um, the platform features with 100% data ownership allowed us to work with big enterprise companies that require that by design, by default. So uh, these are the companies that we have started working with either on pilots or a commercial stage, and we're moving forward with a great team. Uh, myself, who has a great expertise in business, my co-founder Mead, who is a serial inventor with 70 patterns for his name, and Daniel, who has a great expertise in logistics. And um, we were a partner with Arrow and Avnet as our manufacturers. So we provide the blueprint of the sensor we can produce on scale. And that's about it to finish up that we're doing the fundraise of 4 million right now. And um, part of it is being covered by our investors from Europe and we're looking for the investors from the US and talking to a lot of them now and happy to discuss. Great Alexa, thank you very much. But the train of innovation doesn't stop here. The next company has developed a solution that translates data into a semantic model which can be used from several machines, applications, and devices. Unlike existing IoT middleware solutions, this one provides both vertical and horizontal integration and enables real-time machine communication. Welcome Emotion to the Summer Summit. Hello, I'm Michael. I'm the co-founder and managing director of Munich-based startup Emotion. You have probably been hearing a lot about Industry 4.0, the Internet of Things, smart factories. There are plenty of visions about these going around. But where are the tangible concepts on how to broadly implement these visions beyond single pilot projects? This is where Emotion comes into play. 
we are offering a communication platform for machines and systems that has been built from the ground up based on paradigms of Industry for Zero. With this platform, we enable our clients to digitalize machines, factories and other processes faster, cheaper and with better outcomes. For example, any modern machine can produce huge amounts of data. For quality control, sensors inspect every product, while other sensors record wear and tear. But what happens with all that data? Typically, data is collected, collated, and forwarded to some cloud service. The actual analysis is handled by algorithms provided by a third party. The results are only available after analyzing a finished production lot. So the optimized parameters can only be applied to the next batch. That's roughly the status quo as offered by our competitors. Using a platform like our Indigo instead will allow you to run these tasks on-premise. For example, any individual machine can be made smart or the data from a production line can be analyzed right in the edge controller running that line. And since Indigo, unlike other solutions, fully supports hard real-time, meaning deterministic data access, Results from the ongoing analysis can be fed back during active production runs for preemptive process optimization. It is said that data is the new oil. Staying within that metaphor, you could say that Emotion is a new kind of oil company. We extract crude data, refine it, transport it where it is needed. We call this approach liquefying data. Because like a liquid, data in Indigo can flow freely allowing it to be channeled and streamed anywhere you want. This concept facilitates building future-proof, IoT-capable devices, offering machine builders saving potentials of up to 50%, plus new revenue opportunities of at least 20% by providing value-added services to their customers. But we also enable quick and painless retrofits to existing facilities without hassles like extended downtime. Besides initial project implementation revenue, monetization of our innovation will be primarily based on software licensing fees employing a subscription model. Experts estimate the global market for industrial IoT solutions to reach a volume of 110 billion US dollars by 2026. The serviceable available market for our platform is roughly 10 billion US dollars. So our goal in the medium term is to reach a market share of 150 million US dollars. Indigo isn't just some wild fantasy cooked up by a group of young startup hipsters. Our founding team comprises more than one century of relevant and complementary experience in software development, digitalization, and production process improvement. We are currently realizing a series of lighthouse projects with selected premium partners. For further scaling, we have a funding requirement of 3 million euros that we want to raise with our ongoing seed round. With Indigo, we are contributing our part to keep Germany on the cutting edge of technology and ensure long-term competitiveness on the global market. Thank you. Thanks, Emotion team, for the great presentation. The next company that is going to present has developed a B2B SaaS platform that will help businesses to implement IoT solution for their critical business operation. If you think about that, you can understand how many things you can, if you would implant like such a solution, you can think about how many things you can understand if you could have a global perspective of what is happening around you. I can't wait to hear that. Please join the stage, Cavity Wireless. Hi everyone, my name is Tarun and I present uh, Cavity Wireless. So Cavalry Wireless is an IoT company uh, that is headquartered in the US. We are currently 40 employees and we have our operations in India and Spain. Uh, what we do exactly is we operate in the IoT market uh, by in order to enable companies to launch their products. So currently what happens is there's a hardware that goes into the device that needs to be connected to the cloud. And this process is dominated by high fragments, uh, monopolies that makes the go-to-market uh, very difficult. Uh, with high RMG, high integration, high logistics, and high capex. This is where we come into picture. We produce and manufacture the IoT modules that comes with an eSIM and the uh, reloaded connectivity as well as the platform. So we launched this into a bundle known as the Hubble 99 with a monthly subscription of 99 cents, which includes the module, the connectivity, and the platform. 
Our customer segments are mostly large OEMs and IoT product companies uh, that ranges from uh, different uh, industry verticals uh, and use cases such as EV charging, solar, waste management, etc. Uh, where we are agnostic to the end application and use case. So for us, the go-to market is pretty much always straightforward. And uh, these are two use cases that we illustrate. One is vaccine monitoring for a German logistics company. And the other is an automotive e-bike uh, company in India, uh, which uh, launches its uh, fleet of uh, bikes. Uh, in terms of competitive landscape, we compete with uh, some of the biggest companies in the world uh, that is focused on the IoT uh, module part. And what we do is we uh, cover the rest of the pillars as well by uh, giving the connectivity, the platform, the app store, et cetera. Uh, in terms of our readiness, we are product ready, market ready. We have a seed round close. We have a healthy pipeline. We have 40 full-time employees now. Now we're moving to a series A. Then this round, we'll use it for launching our 5G and app store. Our seed round was conducted last year for an approximate $2 million. And uh, we have our series A this year. And I'll be happy to talk on this regard uh, after this uh, meeting. And in terms of our, uh, uh, we are also looking to partner with corporates uh, in different sectors. And uh, these are some of the sectors that we'd like to explore. Uh, myself, Tarun, our team is this. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please let me know and uh, we can take it over. Thank you. Very interesting. Thanks, guys. And now let's welcome Oliver and Flexi Robotics that have developed an adaptive robots to automate complex tasks like with the human-like coordination in uncertain environments thanks to AI and computer vision. Welcome, Oliver. Hi, everyone. My name is Oliver Wong from Flexi Robotics. Today, it's my great honor to present our company at Plug and Play Summer Summit 2021. Flexi is developing and manufacturing the world's first adaptive robots, which integrate force control, computer vision, and the AI technology. All the co-founding members are from Stanford Robotics and AI Lab. The existing robotics technology framework limits the level of robots flexibility and universality as well as the application scope. The following works are not automatic at all. Precision part plugging and assembly, curve circuit polishing and roughing, grasping and sorting. The common reason is that there are complex tasks with human hand and eye coordination in changing and uncertain environment. How to define adaptivity? There are three features high tolerance for precision variance with disturbance reduction, transferable intelligence. And we think that the adaptive robots can bring the following values, accomplish more tasks, upgrade the flexibility of your production lines, optimize the total cost of ownership. We introduced Ryzen in 2019. We have Ryzen with four and 10 kilograms and the force control accuracy can achieve 0.1 Newton and even 0.03 Newton. And the we have a lot of application cases in the industry of automotive, electronics, healthcare, and logistics. We have representative customers such as Amazon US, LG Korea, IPO, battery supplier in China. We have the following application scenarios, plugging and assembly, curve service power sizing, picking and sorting. So here is the case of uh, speaker coin assembly, and we use adaptive robots to per to perform a complex high precision component of the electronics industry. So there are several steps. The first step is material detection. Because the stable coin are in different position and orientation, we need to detect it. And then we will do adaptive picking. We will use force control to tolerate the precision error. And then we will do material placement. We will use force sensing to place it on the groups. And then we will use we will change the orientation and the amount of the force to do the press fitting. So this is the industrial case. We meet all the requirement of them then in terms of successful rate, cycle time, and uh, placement accuracy. And uh, we raised 100 USD dollars in CSB and marking the largest uh, single round fund fundraising ever in the field of general purpose robotics. And uh, here uh, we wanted to uh, connect with you and all the corporate partners to conduct more pilot studies. Thank you. Thanks, Oliver. I would love to use it one day. Unfortunately, we are coming to the end of the summit 
and I would like to remind you to vote for the company you like the most, that will be announced via LinkedIn. On my end, and from the World Smart Cities team, I would like to thank you, all the great founders and projects for this special Internet of Things Summer Summit. To be honest, I love this job because crossing the life path of these amazing entrepreneurs makes me realize that there are wonderful people that spend time and effort in solving the hardest problems out there. I think these are the things that inspire our society. I'm sure you agree with me. I hope you all enjoyed this live stream event. And to conclude, I would like to thank you all for having attended the Summer Summit. And I truly believe that a big shout out is needed again to the operations team that made this event real and all my colleagues at Plug and Play that made this summer summit unforgettable. Now it's time to know each other and discuss about all these exciting projects. Let's meet us uh, there on Attendify at the networking session. Feel free to reach out the startup you might have questions for and on my end, I will be there. I will meet you there on Attendify. Enjoy. How do you track your team's innovation efforts? However that is, we've got an easier way. Let us introduce Playbook. Playbook is Plug and Play's innovation software. It is an exclusive tool only available for our ecosystem's corporate partners. With it, you and your team will be able to browse your curated startups database, create, discover, and rate lists of startups, Track your engagement, pilots, and investments. Analyze data from the tech ecosystem. Organize private sessions with select startups. And so much more. Hundreds of corporations count on Playbook to empower their innovation journey. Get in touch to start using Playbook today.